imagine midnight after a storm. A riverside neighborhood sits under brown floodwater that turns streets into canals. Flashlights sweep across a surface so calm it looks like polished glass. Somewhere out there a long log shifts, as if adjusting its weight, then slips under without a ripple. Now imagine I tell you the ambush waiting beneath is not a crocodile and not an anaconda. It is Titanoboa, the largest snake ever to crawl on Earth. Would you still keep paddling? Stay to the end to learn how to survive a close encounter. And subscribe so you do not miss the next chapter. 58 to 60 million years ago, in the tropical swamps of northern South America, a river hunter ruled the channels. Titanoboa serigenensis is known from fossils at the Serajan coal mine in Colombia. The bones outline a body 13 to 15 meters long, over 40 feet, with a trunk the width of a barrel. The torso could measure a meter across. If it crossed your living room, its back would reach the hip height of an adult human. The mass may have exceeded a metric ton. There was no venom, but none was needed. Titanoboa belonged to the Boidae, a family that kills with speed, grip, and pressure. A bite with many backward hooked teeth pins a prey animal. In the next instant, coils pour over like a fallen bridge cable and squeeze. Blood pressure collapses, organs go into ischemia, and the brain is starved of oxygen. Minutes later, the struggle is over. With a lower jaw that swings far behind the skull, Titanoboa could swallow huge fish, thick-shelled turtles, and even ancient crocodilians. Water made that size possible. A giant snake on dry land pays an energy tax for every inch it lifts. In the river, the body becomes almost weightless. Buoyancy saves energy, and soft silt hides a hunter of extraordinary length. As a cold-blooded animal, Titanoboa borrowed heat from its surroundings. Warm water raised metabolism, sharpened reflexes, and accelerated digestion. Studies that link reptile size to ambient temperature suggest the Paleocene climate helped grow this muscular engine. That raises a modern question. If today's climate keeps warming, will the stage be ready for a return of such giants? If Titanoboa lived now, the map almost draws itself. The Amazon and Orinoco basins are endless mosaics of flooded forest. The Everglades in Florida have already proven that a warm wetland can host invasive giant snakes, the Lower Mekong, the brackish Sundarbans, the swamps of the Congo, all offer poor visibility, tangled shelter, and large prey, catfish, caimans, and crocodiles, river turtles, even deer-crossing irrigation canals, add up to a menu worthy of a king. Daylight keeps the snake still along shaded banks. Twilight wakes it. In full dark, it begins to rule. Dawn on an Amazon reservoir. Vapor lifts off a surface as wide as a sea. A ball of catfish holds under the dam. Small boats drift in wait. Then the water writes a faint circle as if someone lowered a cable into the lake. Fish finders go silent. An angler looks down and the last thing he sees is a dark ribbon a yard thick sliding like a mud arrow. The boat rocks once. Lines go slack, then tight, then nothing. No blood, no scream, only absence. When you see Titanoboa, you are late to the story. How much would it eat? A ton of snake does not need daily meals like a mammal of equal mass. Modern giant boas and pythons endure long fasting periods. In a rich season, Titanoboa could eat a large prey animal, a heavy turtle, a juvenile crocodile, a wild pig, and then disappear into a reed bed for days. The fear comes not from frequency, but from selectivity. It takes easy prey at predictable funnels. The step across a water trail, the ferry landing, the nightlight that gathers fish, now Florida after a hurricane. The city is a shallow lake. A golf course becomes a freckled marsh. A three-meter alligator rests on a trolley track. A rescue drone pans over a pond and finds a shadow that stretches too far to make sense. The alligator drops straight down, as if a trap door opened under its feet. One ring of water closes. No sound, no big splash, only the outline of something missing. Give that shadow a name. Ecology would change, but not entirely for the worse. In some damaged systems, a super predator can reset balance. Titanoboa might reduce carcass feeders, push down crop-raiding feral pigs, trim overabundant capybaras, 
and thin out young crocodilians. Nutrient cascades often follow, and plant communities stabilize. There is a price. Ranching near rivers loses animals. Cage aquaculture adds heavy-duty barriers. Recreational paddling needs clearly controlled safe zones and season-based curfews. One incident can turn a story about restoration into a story about public danger. Night in an Asian delta. A new moon hangs over flooded fields. Coarse screens guard a culvert to hold fish. Dogs bark, then stop. A thousand ducks shiver. Along the bank, a strange bar of mud bends with the current. A flashlight finds the shape a moment too late. A single heavy gulp. Two minutes later, the water is flat again. People respond the way we always do. We try to detect, prevent, and argue. Thermal drones skim the banks. Submerged vibration sensors watch for long, slow pulses. Environmental DNA testing samples. Water for invisible genetic traces. Low electric fences protect stock pens. Public advisories shift by the hour and forbid swimming at dusk in turbid canals. Containment teams assemble. Semi-wild refuges are proposed. Ethical debates break out. Relocate or remove. The lesson from the Everglades is blunt. Once a giant snake is established, it is rarely removed. Consider a twist of evolution. Suppose modern populations face unusual cool seasons. Individuals that swim longer and hunt more keep core temperatures up with muscle work. Blood vessels reorganize in tiny ways that improve heat exchange, similar in spirit to countercurrent systems in some large fish. Across many generations, even a small advantage could allow activity in cooler water. The range might slide toward warm, temperate estuaries in summer. This is not fantasy. Nature is indifferent to our sense of safety. Economics follows fear and curiosity. A coastal city after a flood closes its riverfront businesses and loses a season of income. Fish farms invest in steel mesh and sensors and raise costs by a quarter. National parks add insurance for river tours. Media explodes. Controlled night safaris bloom at the edge of protected zones. Titanoboa becomes nightmare and brand at once. Always a recipe for conflict. How do you survive a meeting with it? First, do not enter turbid water at twilight unless you must. Second, avoid banks with tangled vegetation where visibility is near zero. Third, in small boats, keep a low center of gravity and wear life vests. If you capsize, the vest buys the seconds needed to grab a float and shout for help. On farms, install heavy bar grates on intake and outflow channels and use intermittent strobe lighting at night. The lights will not repel a giant snake, but may make it pause long enough for you to move indoors. Above all, do not play hero. You will not outpull a 15-meter living cable. We like to believe we have tamed the planet. Yet every time the water rises and a swamp expands, an older world draws breath again. Titanoboa may remain a fossil, or it may be a reminder that when conditions align, nature fills empty roles with hunters that fit them perfectly. If tomorrow, a shaky phone video shows a breathing log at the edge of your city. Will you call it fake or begin practicing the rules of coexistence? Tell us whether such a predator should be preserved as wild nature returns or tracked and removed to protect communities. If this story made your pulse jump, like the video and subscribe. Turn on notifications for the next episode where we pit Titanoboa against another ocean-born ghost. Are you ready for that match? The monsters of nature do not wait for anyone.